Welcome to Messiah Evangelical Lutheran Church for this Mother's Day weekend and for this, the fourth Sunday after Easter. This morning we'll hear Jesus preparing us for his resurrection, for his ascension, excuse me, by reminding us that he has not abandoned us. And we'll get to look at the account of Elijah and the prophets of Baal uh, to see that God really makes sure we know he has not abandoned us in a very special way in this life. Uh, we'll follow uh, the outline of our service folder, which is drawn from page 38, Service of the Word in the front of our hymnals. We'll join in the response of reading of the psalm for this day, Psalm 33. We'll hear the account of Jesus uh, in John 14, verses 1 through 12, and then we'll have our sermon and uh, back and forth prayer, the Lord's Prayer and a closing prayer and benediction. All right. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And be also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. We pray. Almighty God, we beg you, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts so that he may rule and direct us according to your will. Comfort us in all our temptations and afflictions. Defend us from all error and lead us into all truth so that we may be steadfast in the faith, may increase in love and all good works, and in the end, will obtain everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Psalm 33, as printed in our hymnals on page 79. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We pray. Lord God, through your Son, you made the heavens and the earth. Through him you continue to rule over all things. Make us your chosen people, witnesses of your power and heralds of your glory, to our children and to the world, to the praise of your unfailing love, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Here, the gospel lesson set aside for this, the fourth Sunday after um, Easter, from John chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. Recall, this is from Maundy Thursday. 
Jesus has sent Judas off to do what he was going to do. Jesus has given the Lord's Supper to his disciples. He knows that he is uh, going to go to the cross, but he knows that that'll be done after three days when he returns to them, but he has to go, and he wants to prepare them for his being no longer visibly present. So, from John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Here ends the gospel lesson to which we respond. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. Hallelujah. Part of God's word for our meditation on this um, Mother's Day weekend, this uh, the fourth Sunday after Easter, is the Old Testament account of Elijah versus the prophets of Baal. It's a very long account. I think I would encourage you to read it at home, and we'll just get to discuss it here. Uh, perhaps reading sections, but I'd like to introduce it with some things that happened just before that, starting when Elijah finds um, uh, Obadiah, who has been hiding 50 prophets of God in a cave from Ahab. Elijah goes to him uh, and asks him to go to Ahab and tell Ahab that Elijah's here. And Obadiah says, and now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here? He will kill me. Elijah said, As the Lord Almighty lives whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. So Ob Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. This is God's word. We bow our heads in prayer. Most gracious Lord Jesus, we live in a world of terrible confusion, and we are often confused ourselves. Encourage us through your word that you can protect us from the same and turn things to the good for the saving of many people and of us too. In your name we pray, amen. 
friends in Christ. Stand-up comedian Jeff Allen tells the story of how he wound up becoming a Christian, uh, really, at the hand of God. It started when he was doing stand-up in Florida and a certain wealthy man had turned his back on his wealthy life because he always wanted to be a stand-up comedian. The guy had a membership at a local golf club and although Jeff didn't really care much for the guy himself, he says, uh, he liked golfing for free. He and the man were out golfing once and the man and he got to be to talking about Christianity and Jeff tried to put it off by saying, well, I'm an atheist. The man said to him, oh, have you read the Bible? And Jeff said, no. He said, you're not an atheist, you're a moron. And then he said, an atheist would study the scriptures and all the other religions in the world and after weighing all the evidence would have decided on his own that uh, he didn't think there was any God and that he wasn't going to believe in him. But you, you're lazy. You haven't done anything. All you've said is, well, I just don't want to deal with it, so I'm going to say God doesn't exist. You're a moron. That conversation eventually had its effect on Jeff, but it really took a lot of other things to make him start to come to grips with whether there's a God and who he is. But it brings up a point for you and me. How do you talk to people who say they don't believe in a God? And what do we do ourselves when our own sinful natures are confronting us with things and trying to make us think that God doesn't exist or that if God did exist, why are these kinds of things happening? And, uh, and, and we have all kinds of issues within ourselves because our sinful natures are unbelievers. Our sinful natures are atheists and are attacking us constantly. What hope do we have that we can stand against this thing? And what hope do we have that all those people out there who don't even think about God, that anything is going to ever turn them around? What do you do? If there was anybody who could have felt completely at a loss for that, it would have been Elijah. And in fact, there would be a time in his life when he would feel that way. But God let something happen that showed Elijah that the Lord can turn things around. He can turn things around because he has the power to break the grip of unbelief on us, and he has the power to break the curse of unbelief on us. If there was a time when somebody needed anyone to break the grip of unbelief, it was at this time. If we live in an era where more and more people call themselves the nuns because they think no religion, none, really applies to them. If we live in a time when more and more people seem to be coming irreligious and say, oh, I'm spiritual, I just don't go to church. Well, boy, did they then. And it was not just because they were wooed by a good economy. They were being wooed by Jezebel who imported her prophets of Baal and prophetess, prophetesses of Ashtoreth uh, from her dad's kingdom up in Lebanon. Uh, and they were starting to think, well, I, I don't want to be forced to choose. I don't want to get Jezebel mad at me. Uh, I, I, I kind of believe in God, but God doesn't, you know, he's not going to kill me like Jezebel would. Uh, and my life really depends on my getting along well with the government. So they had all these kinds of things going on in their lives that made them stop worshiping God. It got so bad that a major place where people used to worship God, where there was an altar that was all set up, had completely fallen apart and crumbled or been torn apart. 
Elijah could have thought, how do you get through to any of these people? But he didn't give up hope because he knew God. He was willing to confront Ahab, even though Ahab uh, was really hunting him down, trying to kill him. Obadiah had to hide 50 pastors in a cave because Ahab was trying to kill anybody uh, who supported Elijah. And if he had known somebody who actually knew where Elijah was, oh, that guy's life would be in danger. So when Elijah comes to Obadiah, Obadiah is rightfully frightened, but Elijah says, don't worry about this. I'm going to see the guy myself today. And when Ahab tries to act the way so many unbelievers do, as if God, you and your God, are at fault for all the problems around here, you're the troubler of Israel, uh, Elijah throws it right back in his face and says, no, 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 this is your problem not mine. But Elijah knows that God can defend him. uh, And when he calls a man a moron, uh, that God can lead that man to see things and lead others to see things as well. Elijah goes on the top of Mount Carmel, just where you would expect the prophets of Baal to be. Uh, He has them all meet him up there in a place where they think this is their home turf. Because they thought that a god would live on the highest promontory in their area so that he could rule over everything that he could see. It's the same idea that gave people the idea that the Greek gods lived on Mount Olympus and that led the Romans to think that there was some spiritual Olympus where their gods lived and oversaw all the activities of man. Elijah says, we're going to meet on the top of Mount Carmel the highest mountain peak in the area. Because he knows that God can lead people to see something. We know the story, how he tells them, look, let's each take a calf, let's slaughter it, let's put it up as a sacrifice to our gods, but you, you put it on your altar, do not uh, light a fire, you call on your God and ask him to light it and me I'll do the same and he says since there are so many of you you go first he seems to give them the advantage of showing that their God is real right up front which would have been a great risk to him that he would not have had a chance if their God actually existed and actually caused the fire to burn up the sacrifice nobody would even wait to listen to him He was taking a risk, but it was a risk he knew he could take because he knew what was real. And that's the thing about our God, is he shows people just what's real. God knows when people put their hope in something like this. That's not real. He calls these things emptinesses in the scriptures because they have nothing to them. The Apostle Paul says these people worship nothing but demons. And on another uh, part of 1 Corinthians, he says a person who worships an idol worships nothing at all. There's nothing there. God knew that he could put these prophets of Baal in a situation where they would seek to call on their God and nothing would happen because there was nothing there. But God does something else so that other people realize what he already knows and so that he breaks the grip of unbelief. God makes a complete mockery of this. We hear... Elijah saying to these guys, hey, maybe your God is asleep. He's a God after all, you know. Maybe he is out relieving himself, some translate. Maybe he's out on a walk. Uh, Maybe he's uh, just really busy. He's a God, you know. Uh, He makes it, he, he mocks their God as if their God is such a busy guy that they have to be really loud in order to get his attention. I I suppose you could say that that's complimentary, but we're told he mocks them. 
You and I listen to this and we say to ourselves, oh, I'm uncomfortable with that. I, I wouldn't want to mock anything because that would be so disrespectful and would only make them angry. But God knows something. He knows that sometimes the only way that he personally can get through to people is by letting them see just how stupid they've become by, by putting their hope in these things. He doesn't need you and me. He can tell Elijah to mock because Elijah has the Holy Spirit speaking to him directly about these kinds of things. You and I do not have that advantage. But we know we have a God who makes it pretty clear that people are not being sensible. Do you remember that time in Matthew chapter 12 when the Pharisees and Sadducees are accusing Jesus of casting demons out by Beelzebub? Jesus has to point out to them that they're not making any sense. If I cast out be demons by Beelzebub, then by whom do your own children cast demons out? He says to them. And then when they say, well, you know, uh, he's working for Satan. Jesus says, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. If Satan is fighting against his own workers, his kingdom will fall. He doesn't work that way. Jesus has to point out to them that they are really being dumb. Paul in 2 Thessalonians says that uh, God does the same thing with all kinds of people who put their hope in the Antichrist. Paul tells us that there would be this person who would arise within the church who would set himself in God's temple in a prominent place within God's church and act as if he was the head of the church and as if uh, everyone had to listen to him in order to have hope of eternal life and that God would make it so that, uh, there, that Satan could actually do all kinds of counterfeit miracles through this guy and through his church to deceive people because they would not believe the truth. God gives them a lie so outrageous that they look absolutely stupid in the face of it and would have to wind up saying, wow, I believed that when I could have just believed that God gave me eternal life for free through Christ. What was I thinking? God does this for you and me all the time. We put our hope in our finances. We put our hope in our jobs, our own personal efforts and activity. And then God, with just a slightest flick of his finger, causes a, a natural disaster that undoes everything we have and lets us know, why did I ever think that my hope of happiness and joy depended on my bank account or my wallet or my job or my efforts or on anything. My family can't protect me. I love my kids. I love my spouse, but they can't protect me from this. What was I thinking? My only hope is God alone. And so our God, who really loves us, knows sometimes we are in the grip of unbelief. And he has to break that grip by letting us realize just how foolish we've been. But thanks be to God, he doesn't just do that. Because if, if that was all he did, we would look at ourselves and say, I guess I'm just too dumb to go to heaven. I, I too easily worship all these other things in my life. What hope is there for someone like me? God, because he loves us, doesn't just want us to see that we've made a terrible mistake, but he wants us to see that he can break the curse of unbelief on us too. These people had seen, had put all their hope, well, at least they'd hedged their bets, you might say, by putting some hope in the bales because they thought the bales were in control of the weather that these gods who supposedly sat on all these mountaintops would make sure that the moisture rose up from the sea and hit the cold air up there and caused snow that would accumulate and melt and fill the rivers and irrigate all of their fields, that their hope of having any decent kind of a life really depended on all that kind of thing. 
And for that reason, God said through Elijah, there's going to be a, a, an end of rain until I say so. So that they would look at the bales and go, why can't the bales do anything to save us? But then when this happens and people uh, see the fire from God come down and burn up the sacrifice that's been sopped wet, burn up the wood that's been sopped wet, burn up the stones that have been sopped wet, lick the water out of the trench around it and burn up the dirt as well while the prophets of Baal have nothing going on for them, when they see all this happening, they suddenly say, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. They call him by his name, the Savior God, realizing this is the God who saves us. And then he makes it stick. He brings an end to the curse this unbelief has brought in them by leading uh, them to get rid of those prophets of Baal so that they cannot lead them astray and destroy them again. And then God causes, as Elijah's servant sees, what looks like just a little cloud, the shape of a man's hand, rise up out of the sea. And within moments, that little cloud has filled the air so much that there's thunder and lightning going on everywhere and the rain is coming down so heavily that Elijah has had to warn Ahab, you better get home if you want to make it. God has the power to undo the curse of unbelief. We don't need a rainstorm to prove that because we've got what Jesus did on the cross. If there was ever a curse of unbelief, it was what Satan could do to us because of it. We had done all of these things that were wrong, and we couldn't believe that God would love us. And Satan said, because you have sinned, you have to die forever. His name, Satan, means the accuser. He's not our friend. His goal all along was to get us to do things so that he could destroy us. But it was at the worst moment of all that, when all of these things fall on the head of our God and Savior, that Jesus turned it all around and used it to slay Satan and every single one of his demons in a way by taking out of their mouths every accusation they could make against us. They no longer can say, you deserve to go to hell, because that curse has been taken away. Jesus became a curse for us when he died on that tree. And now he can say to Satan and the demons, you killed an innocent man. You have no right to accuse anybody. And I paid for all their sins. You have no right to bring this up anymore. And because of that, you and I have a rain shower of God's grace and mercy that falls on us every day. The Apostle Paul says that we stand under grace. It's as if we are standing in the midst of a downpour that every time my sinful nature brings out another evil thought, another evil word, another evil deed, the rain of God's love and grace in Christ is washing it away so that it can't stick to me. And he makes it so that I can believe him. Satan made Adam and Eve think God was holding out on them. But at the cross, God shows you and me that he holds nothing back for himself, nothing at all. He gives up uh, being equal to God and makes himself a servant and makes himself a slave and makes himself a curse. He, he goes through anything. He will hold nothing back. And so now he makes it so that you and I have the curse of unbelief broken for us. Now everything that came along with it, that terrible drought, is gone. And the evil prophets who worked to promote it are gone too. Jesus prepared us in the gospel lesson by saying, 
I'm going away, but I'm not really abandoning you. I'm going to make sure you get to go to heaven. What he did with Elijah on that mountain shows us that while Jesus isn't physically visible to us, he's looking out for us because the Lord can turn things around. We look at the way unbelief is in our world and the way unbelief is in us and we see that God breaks the grip of unbelief on us and he can do it to our, for our friends and for the people of our nation, for the people of the world. And, and not only that, but he can break the terrible curse so that people look at him and go, this is the Lord, this is the Lord, this is the Lord. I will put my hope in him. And that every day you and I are encouraged to do that too. Jeff Allen eventually uh, listened to some Bible study tapes that that man had uh, mailed to him from somewhere else and came to the conclusion, this is the God I've been looking for all my life. God saved him. But that's just the way he is. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray our response of prayer. Eternal God and Father, we give you thanks for the blessings we share as members of your holy church, for your gracious word and sacraments, for opportunities to worship and to grow in faith and knowledge, for occasions to serve and be served, for fellowship with believers in our congregation and in our synod. Jesus Christ, Lord of the Church, you give grace to your people by calling us to be your witnesses in the world. Open our eyes to see the great and noble mission that lies before us, in the hurting eyes of the lonely, in the pained eyes of the sick, and in the searching eyes of the lost. Help us to see your face, O Jesus, and to serve others as we would serve you. Holy Spirit, giver of life, through word and sacrament, bestow on us the wisdom and power we need to witness clearly and to act boldly. Help us to speak the truth in love, to give the reason for the hope we have, and to conduct ourselves with gentleness and respect. Hear us, Lord, as we pray for a family member, an acquaintance, a neighbor, or a friend who does not believe in you or whose faith is weak or troubled. And we do that with a moment of silence. Bless the church with men and women who are willing to proclaim your word in places where we cannot go. Keep them and their loved ones in your care and let nothing hinder their work. By the power of the gospel, restore their spirits each day so that they do not lose heart as they serve us and others. Move us to support them with our sincere prayers and generous offerings. Lord God, on this weekend of Mother's Day, we ask that you would bless moms. We know that, like all of us, they have sinful natures too that fill them with shame over mistakes they've made, harsh words they've spoken, uh, cruel things that they may have done, uh, and lead them to regret uh, and to feel, be filled with fear for the eternal welfare of their children. Remind them that you love their children too and that you will not abandon them and remind them that they have a Savior in Jesus Christ as mothers so that their sins too are forgiven. Uh, still be with them and strengthen them and help them to serve and fill their children and their husbands with such joy and such gladness that they look out for them, they pray for them, they support them in every possible way. Lord God, in the midst of this pandemic, we ask that you would look out for all the governments of the world, 
uh, for all of the doctors and nurses and emergency helpers, for those who are developing ways to stop this kind of disease. We ask that you would be with our several governors and our president and our legislatures. We ask that you would bless their efforts, that you would protect people, that somehow you would pull us out of this, and that you would pr protect our jobs and our livelihood in the meantime. But most of all, remind us of our Savior and of our hope in him. Wherever your word is proclaimed, O Lord, grant it success. Let your kingdom come to us and others, so that we and many more might join the assembly of saints and angels to sing your praise forever. Savior of all, hear our prayer and help us in our mission. Amen. And we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we pray, Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for tuning in uh, and being with us. God bless you all in every way. A very happy Mother's Day.